So here we are as part of World Piano 88. And I have to say a bit of a personal thrill for me, this one, because I've been a Sonata Arctica fan for many years. And as a keyboard player, therefore, Henrik has always been someone who I've looked up to. And so it's really, really cool to have Henrik as part of this special World Piano Day 88 event. Henrik, nice to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And thanks for having me. It's That's nice good, to be man. part of something like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really important to me as we've put this event together to have different styles of music involved. We've got some really well-known classical piano players in during the day. We've got some guys from rock and metal like you. We've got all kinds of different people involved, and it's just really cool to be able to bring lots of people together who get so much out of this great instrument. And I guess in metal, keyboards is not always the instrument that gets the most attention, but what was it that attracted you to play keyboard in the first place? Uh, what was the typical story, I think, for anybody who's plays the piano, your mom puts you on piano lessons when you're a kid. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, at, uh, at some point when I grew up, then uh, I started to, to listen to other music, uh, rock music, ACDs, stuff like that with no keyboards. And then eventually you stumble upon Deep Purple and, and realize that, yeah, you can play keyboards in rock and roll. That's cool. Yeah. So, so that was basically the start for me. So like John Lord, he would be a, an early hero for you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a massive hero. I, I'm, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, yeah. he could really play. Yeah, totally. And uh, and it's I, it's it was a huge influence on me uh, mm. growing up. How and then of course, uh, yeah, of course later, uh, then I uh, you know listened to guys like uh, Kevin Moore from Dream Theater and stuff like that, and got into more progressive. Uh, Stuff, but I think John Lord was the, was the starting point for me to to mm. venture into rock music. And of course, maybe Jordan Rudess, as Dream Theater went on, he, he's a really serious player. Yeah, yeah, he's too much. <laughs> <laughs> are you still are you still a Dream Theater fan these days? Uh, yeah, sometimes, but uh, but it was. Um, I think uh, the most impact for me was was like when he just when he joined Dream Theater with uh, with Liquid Tension experiment and and looking forward to the new album as well so yeah. that was like the breaking point i i once uh, saw dream theater play live when they were doing the tour for uh, scenes from a memory which is my my favorite dream theater album and you could just feel yeah. every musician in the room just go oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's just no yeah. point anymore uh, yeah, we were actually me and me and a couple of friends went to to see that show uh, back in the day when they played scene from memory, and yeah, it was exactly like that. You know, everybody yeah. goes like, oh, "Okay." <laughs> yeah. So, how old were you when you when you first played keyboards? How how old were you when you had your first piano lesson? You, you said you had lessons. Yeah, I had some lessons when I was a kid. Uh, I think I was maybe five, six, six years old mm -hmm. when I started, and. I played classical music up until my teens, 15, 16, maybe. Okay. And then, uh, uh, yeah, somehow I, I realized that if I want to be really good, I need to practice a lot more in that. So I <laughs> venture into some other things. Then. Uh, it was like, I mean, um, I, I understood the work that needs to be done in order to, to play classical music uh, very well. And I, I just don't think I had it in me. To do to, to do the, that amount of work so I, I started to play other things then were there any uh, exams that you do what's the instrumental system like in Finland is it are there exams that you can work your way through uh, yeah they are just like uh, first you get like the minor exams it's, it's uh, one one two and three and then then you get like the bigger ones which is also one two and three uh, and the, the big three being then like a master piano player or something like that. So, and did you ever do any of the grades at all? Any of the uh, exams? Uh, I did the, the first three, the beginner, the beginner ones that you do as a kid. <laughs> then, yeah, and then that was it. So, yeah. And did you ever do any sort of classical performances? Were you playing in school? Were there any concerts that you played at that time? Uh, we had to perform at uh, like this matinee kind of thing where all the pupils 
from the music school were playing. So you go up there and you play your piece and then the next one comes on and stuff like that. But uh, I didn't like it at all. It was somehow, I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say I have stage fright, but but it, it was horrible. Like the whole situation, you're a little kid and you, you just learned this one song and then you had to go up and play it. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. It, it was really hard for some reason. I mean, I never had that kind of feeling when uh, when I go up and play with the band or something like that, because then you're not alone. But it, when it's a sport, yeah, yeah. it's only on you and, you know, and and so it's, I, I think it was very important to do that uh, in yeah. order to, to get better. But, but it was, I, I somehow, it, it stuck in my mind. The image is like, it was horrific. <laughs> it was like... Because it's such a solo instrument, isn't it, piano? There's really nowhere to hide at all when you're doing that yeah. kind of performance. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's a little bit like um, what we have uh, done now with Sonata Arctica is that we have done these acoustic uh, shows from time to time. And yeah. uh, that's a little bit uh, a nod to that direction. Of course, you still have the band there, so it's not all on you. But 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 uh, uh, now I, I enjoy it quite a bit because you're... Uh, held responsible. Uh, I mean, if you if you play a uh, play a rock song, you just most of the part you, you maybe just hold down a chord and that's it. Uh, yeah. But when you play acoustically, you're always responsible for the notes you make, and it's like everything is. I mean, there's not a wall of sound, so you can hear everything clearly and everything. So you, you cannot live fuck around so much you know <laughs> one of the things i'd be interested to ask you about so you might not remember this but the first time i ever met you was in i think 2008 or 2007 2008 around that time and so i was working on the project where tony from sonata was going to come and sing with a choir i was working with at the time and yeah. i did the choir choir arrangements for the uh, cage one of the songs and shamandalai yeah and yeah. The first time I ever met you was backstage in London at a Sonata show uh, when right. you were playing playing with um, Epica. Epica was the support. Okay, all right. And I had uh, written out the music to come and show Tony because I didn't know that Tony couldn't read music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The arrangement. And I handed it to Tony and said, you know, as a proud fan, here, here is the music yeah. I have written. Yeah. And he said... I can't read that. Henke can and handed it to you. <laughs> yeah, let me look at that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. First time I've ever met you. And yeah, uh, yeah that was a long time ago. So when Sonata music is put together, is it ever written down? Do you ever write any of the music down or is it all just by ear? Mm, no, I mean, we do write. Uh, sometimes we make like these char chord charts, but that's it. And, mm. and usually not even that. So, uh, because Tony doesn't uh, read music, and, uh, my music reading, okay, yeah, Henka can read that. Well, sort of, you know. So it's uh, <laughs> it's been a while, and and uh, I haven't uh, had uh, I haven't read music like properly, haven't had to read music for a long time, and and it's mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing that you, you you get really rusty really fast, or that's yeah. how I feel about it. So we do sometimes make chord charts, but uh, but not 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 so much these days. Actually, it's mostly by air. And and because, for example, if I make a, a chart which makes sense to me, then you know Elias goes, ah, no, that I mean, what what does this mean? You know, <laughs> yeah, and so so um yeah, it, it's mostly by air. And and we go by by making demos. You know, you have an idea, you record it, and then just send the MP3 or something like that. So so it's. Uh, there is no notation. I mean, a lot of people. Uh, every once in a while, you get an email like, "Hey, could you send me the the chart for for a uh, yeah for Shaman Lai or or Talula or something?" And you go like, "Well, I could, but I really <laughs> don't have the time to write it down." Yeah. Because yeah. I um have often wondered as a fan for a long time. I know that uh, Sonata have often sort of had some fans who prefer the early stuff when there was less orchestral stuff and it was, you know, just fast, you know, the traditional yeah. power method sound. But as over time has gone, you know, obviously Sonata have increased the amount of use of orchestral stuff and what seems like, you know, more keyboards, more effects, more synths. And so yeah. particularly D Days of Grays, which is my favorite album, yeah. that was when the orchestration really went, you know, up, up, up a level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I often wondered... 
I know that Tony is responsible for a lot of the demoing sort of process and the writing process, but I often wondered how much of it was really crafted in the demo process in terms of the keyboards and the orchestration and how much of it was added later in the studio. Are you able to sort of talk a little bit about how that side of it works? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, uh, what I know from uh, from my time in the band, I mean, before I joined the band, Tony played most of the keyboards. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. And then uh, uh, when I joined uh, on Reckoning Night, there's a lot of keyboards, but there's a lot of overlapping stuff. Uh, me and Tony both playing almost the same things, uh, with almost the same sounds. And, and that was like the first time we worked together. He wanted me to play a lot, but he also wanted to play himself a lot. So uh, so there is it, it's a bit muddy at times. And from there, it has taken quite an amount of years, you know, to, to develop the, the balance between, you know, what stuff do we take from the demo? What stuff is something like, it's just like an idea or a scratch or, or just, you know, so it, it of course depends on the song, but these days, a lot of the melodic ideas on keyboards, it's, they can be riffs and, and licks and stuff like that are taken from the demos. What I prefer to do is to, to record them and change the sounds and and sometimes that's fine and sometimes it isn't so so uh, there's a lot of discussion going back and forth forth with that um but then regarding the orchestration uh for some songs only has like a rough idea or something uh that he has made on his demo and he just sends that uh, to me Muston, and who has done the the orchestra stuff for quite some amount of at these days of grace and and then uh, on some songs here and there after that uh, and he has pretty much worked it out on his own and then he sends uh sends like uh sends the version and, and maybe there's some fixes done or something but but that's uh, uh, a lot of the stuff is from him i mean the melodic themes might be from tony but uh, but as a whole he works out uh, you know how, how to arrange the stuff because there are just so many layers in, in that sort of period of Sonata material. It's incredible. And one thing that really interested me was, so a couple of years ago when Tony did his uh, Sonata Symphonica project, where yeah. it was a whole concert of Sonata material arranged for orchestra, and I was lucky yeah. enough to do one of the songs for that. I did Juliet. Um, yeah. He sent through the MIDI tracks to give me like yeah. a starting point so I didn't have to do it all by ear. Otherwise, I yeah. would have just been there, there forever. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was really interesting to see how many layers had gone into it. Because, of course, yeah. on record, you just hear the overall effect. Yeah. But there I, there I could see how much was going on. And as a, you know, as a fan and an arranger, that was really, really interesting to, to see that. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think, also something that we have been, been trying to, to, to learn and, and to get better at, to make it sound uh, thick and not have so much stuff in there because during that time it was like that and Unia and uh, around that time it, it was just like a huge amount of, of different kind of melodic content. And that was, uh, I think it was really nice and it was a lot of fun, but it's also, um, I mean, it's said that human ear, like a basic listener, when you listen, you can focus on about three or maybe four things at once. Yeah. And you got and you like you said you've seen how much stuff is in there and especially yeah. a song like Juliet that's a little bit more on the progressive side, so yeah. so uh, it gets too much sometimes and so so we try to simplify. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I remember sort of kind of being uh, having to persuade Tony a little bit of the idea that that song would work with orchestra because there was just so much going yeah. on. And he, I, don't, I don't think he was all that keen to sing it. I think he, yeah. he would felt quite, quite exposed because he's used yeah. to all these layers around him. Yeah. When, you, when, you come, when you come to doing the stuff live, how do you decide? Because obviously that was, that was the period in Sonata's career when there was the most going on in terms of the, yeah. the keyboards. How, how do you decide for, you know, across the board which tracks and which layers you're going to play live and because obviously you you guys have got back in yeah. tracks playing some of the additional stuff how do you decide yeah. which things you want to play live and which ones are going to go on the on the tape well it's uh it's funny well it's not funny it's horrible actually because first that uh, well well the first thing is like like when we go from start or we start to learn a song before we record it if i would only play like the piano track i will be quiet for most of the time 
So I have yeah. to figure out, okay, there's a piano, then there's a string. And, I, you know, so I first have to figure out something to play so I can play along with the guys, you know. And then after that, we record, I start to figure out what actually is happening, uh, record the tracks and, and, and do all that. And then when the album is done, then I listen to the mix and see which of the keyboards that actually are the most important ones, in my opinion. Uh, and mm. then I strive to play them. So, so, so like the goal for me would be like, even if the backing tracks fell off, I can still play the song from beginning to end and it does sound like the same song. Yeah. So it's it's like I have to learn the song three times, basically. So, so, so it's a bit, <laughs> bit, yeah, it's a bit of a hassle. And then of course, uh, some of the songs um, we don't play immediately on the tour. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, you release an album and you play like five or six cuts from the album, do the tour, do something else. Then five years later, you go like, hey, let's play this song. And then you have to go back and you know what's going on. So, so it's, <laughs> I mean, so it's going back and forth. But I, I, I try to, to make like one, uh, one uh, keyboard track that would work and, and make the song sound somehow right. And then everything else just back in tracks. And so who, who's, have you all got the clicks in your ear or is it just Tommy on the drums? So who, who's, who's driving uh, the click? Well, we actually have it now that we have, I think um, we have three kind of clicks. One is for Tommy always mm-hmm. because he's the drummer and he needs to keep, keep touch. And then uh, the rest of the, there's a, uh, like a band click because there are parts without drums where we're playing. And that goes mm-hmm. to me, Pazzi and Elias. Uh, and then, so, so I only hear the click when I when there's no drums. And then there is ah. uh, one additional click track for Tony because he only needs it at, at a few places during the whole show. Mm. So, so you so all, it's, all it's, your individual. We have, we, yeah, yeah. So we have two, three different click tracks running, and then it's just oh. audible for for whoever needs it at at whatever time. See, it's possible. It's really- <laughs> <laughs> so um obviously during the last year not so much touring and sonata yeah. have historically been a really heavily touring band you've always been a hard-working live band um what yeah. what have you found like sort of not playing live so much how is that how have you found that uh it's weird it's really weird and uh, uh, i think um i don't miss traveling that much actually that's that's something that that's that's okay to some extent and i really enjoy being at home but I, but i really miss uh, playing music with other people i think that's that's the the main thing and of course especially these guys but but it's it's some something very important to me personally to to play together and and of course we play uh, to play in front of an audience that also is something that you kind of get uh, addicted to it and then yeah. all of a sudden when you can't do it it is horrible i mean I can just imagine if, if the situation was that we would handle our business so badly that we couldn't tour, <laughs> how that would feel. Because now it helps, of course, a little bit that it's not your own fault uh, yeah. in, in somehow accepting the situation. But it, it's, I, I think it's really, it is difficult and it's difficult to, to wrap your mind around it. That's really interesting. You should talk about whether, that it not being your fault because... One of the sort of subjects and the themes of, of today, and also and part of my sort of whole um, ethos in everything I do, yeah. is the connection between music and mental health, and how we feel about what we do, and how, what what music yeah. brings us, and what, what in terms of today playing keyboards and piano brings us. And so it's interesting that you should talk about you finding that in some way a little bit easier to deal with because it isn't your fault. And, and so have you yeah. been conscious conscious about that in terms of you know you feel that. Um, you don't feel responsible. Have you? Have you? Has has? I guess what I'm asking: Has music continued to be part of your life, even though you haven't been able to tour this last year? Uh, yes, to some extent. You're still playing. Yeah, of course, I'm still playing. I have to, <laughs> but uh, but but uh, not 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 as much. And it it's also it's different because the thing is, I can uh, or I could <laughs> practice <laughs> practice a lot and, and play a lot by myself. Um, and from time to time, I, I like to do that, uh, but still, I think the music, for me, it becomes music when I share it with somebody. And as long as I can sit here and noodle and do whatever, but as long as it's just me, it's not, I'm not communicating with anybody. 
Mm. And, and I think that's the whole point of music, to to try to convey your feelings to somebody else, be that a bandmate or audience member or whoever. And and as long as I'm just here by myself, my computer and a few keyboards, it's not I'm, I'm not communicating with anybody. So mm. it is fun, but it's not it's it's not why I play music. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing how much the communal shared experience is a really important part of music for a lot of musicians, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, otherwise there wouldn't be any bands, you know, because it's, yeah. believe me, it's a lot easier to get anything done. And, you know, if you do it just by yourself and you don't have to talk talk with anybody or agree with anybody or something like that. And and, and especially being in a band, it's there's a lot of work on that front as well. Luckily, we are mellowing down when we get older, so it's not, you know, <laughs> it's easier to agree. And even if we don't, it's still, uh, it's not going to ruin anybody's day it's we can still you know separate the conversation from the person or, or the difference of opinion from the person uh, which I'm, you guys have been I'm together really a lot yeah absolutely uh, and it's i mean even i who, who wasn't there from the beginning i missed like the first uh, first three albums mm-hmm. i i joined the band at the end of 2002 so mm-hmm. it's almost 20 years so mm-hmm. by now i i know what pisses who <laughs> off and and so so back and forth forth and and, and uh but i think it, it's somehow uh we are at the at the point where it's really fun to tour because everybody knows okay this guy wants to do that this guy wants to do that and then um it's it's really easy to get along because we know each other so well hmm. so during the last year have you been uh, still creating music and to, or are you just playing stuff you already enjoy? Have you created any original stuff whilst you've had the time? Uh, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm recording <laughs> stuff. I mean, I've been writing writing stuff uh, for myself, mainly as uh, you know, to learn and to entertain myself and uh, and things like that. So, so there's some albums that will be out later. I think, and then played on on some friends' songs that they saw. Hey, could you add keyboards to this and, and, and things like that? Like that, what I usually do as well. Uh, but with Sonata Arctica, we have not uh, done any new music now. Uh, so, no. Uh, no. Have you ever fancied creating uh, like a solo album, like just instrumental music? Has that ever been something you've considered? Uh, yeah, I've done actually a, a couple and. and they're out there somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, ah, I'll uh, have a couple of questions. I'm going to hear them. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will send you some links so you can check it out. What kind of music is it? Oh, it's progressive uh, metal, maybe. Yeah. Cool. And it's, oh, uh, well. it's, but it's But the thing thing with the with solo album is, is, is just like, uh, maybe you can, uh, at least uh, the, the feeling I have is like, um, the problem with solo album is that if you do something that sounds similar to your day job, so to speak, yeah. uh, then it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be the same and do something different than people who know you from a day job are not going to like it because that's not what they want. So it's, I mean, you can see that even with with really famous bands making it solo albums, it's like nobody really cares. So th- that's totally fine, but you just have to understand that when you do it, that it's a hobby. And, and and it should remain so but it's i mean i like to enjoy myself and uh, i have a few friends that play uh, with me on those albums and, and uh we have a good time so it's i have been fortunate enough to also have music as a hobby so i will continue yeah. with that regardless excellent so when you just want to relax and put some music on to chill out is it metal related or is it something completely different usually something different because uh, you know when uh, when you have to listen to to metal or, or play when you have to when you get to <laughs> play, <laughs> play me- metal it's like uh, when I put something on then then usually I want something different uh, just because what, uh, I think what kind of stuff do you listen to? Mm, well, it depends, of course, a lot uh, on my mood, but um, I like uh, like Jimi Hendrix sometimes maybe The Doors. Uh, the meters, you know, the funk instrumental funk stuff is really good because you don't have to the vocal distraction. You can just focus on the groove, and uh, I, I I don't know. Sometimes put on some Oscar Peterson and, and realize why you never became a jazz piano player because there's, 
there's no chance, you know. And uh, so it's like um, there's a lot of albums, there's a lot of, of, of stuff. I mean, and everybody always says like, yeah, the music used to be so much better. Well, um, these days we have all the old stuff plus a lot of new stuff as well. So it's yeah. it's only getting better all the time. So so, but it's I mean it's an endless supply and. Uh, there's so much great music to listen to. So it's, I mean, you could waste your life just listening and not doing Absolutely. anything else. Absolutely. Uh, so it, I know that you've got some instruments there. So to yeah. talk us through what you've got there for the people who are interested in, you know, the actual instruments, the other money, the equipment that you play. Uh, yeah. Uh, it might be a bit shaky, but maybe I should show you. Let's see how okay. it works. <laughs> okay. I have, um, this one, what I have right here is the Korg SV-1. It's mm -hmm. a piano. I've been using it live with, with Sonata, but it, it started to be pretty beat down, so I don't use it that much anymore. Um, I, I use it to record because I love the piano sound. And then um, another one that has the same fate here is you have the Korg Kronos. If oh, I yeah, the Kronos, yeah. Turn this one, yeah. Sorry. That is yeah. also totally beat down. Uh, I have a Kurzweil here, a 4 to 7, which I might mm -hmm. take out next time we go out and then speaking of john lord he used to use an odyssey so i got the behringer one because i don't have enough money to get the, the <laughs> more expensive one but but still yeah. uh yeah you get the sound there so uh those are the ones i have right here there's a uh, nord in the corner one yeah yeah you can use that from from uh, for organ i have a nord uh c1 double organ i used on the last tour as well it's in the box behind me so you can't see that yeah. uh, i got one of these because i can't shell down ah yeah this is a mini minimal copy for 300 yeah. bucks in, instead of, uh, of playing for four grand or something yeah. so uh though, though that's the stuff that i have right here in my shed and in the oh, shed you my whole fan yeah you can, you can see my whole face <laughs> as well so uh but i'm um yeah i've, I've been using Kurzweil keyboards live, and then uh, Korg, Triton Karma, and and Kronos, and then on the last tour I used the the Roland FA06 for a few shows, mm -hmm. for a while, and and now I'm, you know, just being confused and waiting when we can get back uh, out, and until then I keep on trading keyboards and trying different things, and it's like that it, it it's horrible because. I don't have to settle. Usually you have a deadline. Okay. You have rehearsals in three weeks. So mm. you just pick, okay, I'm going to use these keyboards. You program the sounds, you learn the songs, you go to rehearsal. But now when uh, nobody really knows what's going to happen, I have all this time to, to, you know, get all tangled up. And, 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 and the more you think about it, the more crazy you go and the less sense it makes. So, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> You don't need the time; you just need a deadline, uh, at least for me to figure out what, what uh, equipment to use. And and, and then, um, if you use uh, a, a new keyboard from from any major brand, we can probably make do with with whatever. So it's like the, di the differences are quite subtle, at least to the casual listener, anyway. Yeah. But it's the never it's never ending musician's quest for more equipment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, luckily. We can't afford to take everything on the road that we want to because uh, it costs a lot to fly, fly with the gear. Uh, so that helps a little bit, <laughs> you know. Otherwise, I don't know how crazy it will get. But uh, <laughs> you try, try to make uh, make the some kind of balance between not being too minimalistic and not mm -hmm. having too much, you know. So, so like enough gear to make it fun, but not too much. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was. Uh... So sometimes I see you play live and you've got a, a flat keyboard stand. Sometimes yeah. it's the diagonal one. Yeah. And so, sometimes it's over the shoulder. Yeah. Why? <laughs> what, 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 what changes which stand you use? Uh, what, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, Jens Johansson, who is a, a hero of mine, he, he used the, the tilted keyboard so you can see what's going on. And, and, and that's Jens really from Stradivarius, yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, 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 um, and that's a brilliant idea because then you can actually see what's going on and not just look at the guy that you see like, uh, like it looks like this. You know, you just see the hand moving. You have no idea what he's doing. Um, 
So, so that's uh, that's his idea, and and uh, I use it um, sometimes. But um, I I, uh, I played a lot with shoulder keyboard before I joined Sonata, and Tony saw that, and then he made me do it. And then so so that's why for years I just played with the shoulder keyboards, and then basically you can see see what's going on. Uh, now in recent years, sometimes I just get tired of it, so I have. Uh, you know, just use it for a few songs and then try different setups. Uh, but at least for me, it's like you, you set it up somehow, play with it for a few years, get bored, change it. And of course, now I have too much time again to think. So, so I, uh, I mean, it, it has come to the point where I'm really, really thinking about why did I play more guitar? So I'm, I'm probably going to bring that back a little bit more. And, and so, so let's see how it goes. But I, I think it's, uh, I would like uh, people to be able, to, or, or also like when if I watch a show, I want to see what the keyboard player is doing. You can see what the guitar player is doing, the bass player, drummer, everybody else. You can see what they're doing. So that is why I, I want the keys to be seen, and hope that you, it's it means something to somebody else as well. Do you think it's like quite a, a metal thing? You know, keyboard players have, have always like struggled to compete for cool points with lead guitarists. <laughs> So do you think it's, yeah. it's like we're, we're desperate for attention? <laughs> ah, yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's what it is, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's an uphill battle, <laughs> but, but <laughs> somebody's somebody's got to do it, and uh, yeah, that's uh, it. and I think it's yeah, I think it's uh, it's fun, and it's I think for the most part when 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 you go on stage and you perform music to people the, the whole idea of it is is to have fun i mean you don't have to make a joke about everything and and all kinds of emotions can be involved but but but, but like the whole idea is that it should be enjoyable uh yeah. for both the listener and the performer and and, and small gimmicks like that uh, might you know give give something more uh, like the stuff that you can't get just from listening to to an album for example yeah yeah I wanted to ask you uh, a question about, um, you know, this idea about how, how music moves us and what it means to us. Is there a Sonata song that actually has an emotional reaction for you? I know, obviously, because you're not necessarily involved in the writing of the lyrics or anything, but in terms yeah. of the music, is there a song that you feel an emotion when you play or is it just playing and, and concentrating? Uh, I think, like, for on on the first tour we played, um, when we started to play, I have a right live. Yeah. Uh, somehow, so that was like when I got over the trickery of of being able to play and sing and to do all that on the same time. Uh, that that's a song a song that sometimes is is a bit emotional to play, especially towards uh, the end of a long tour when you're about to go home. Somehow, something something in there is, is like uh, it makes it a bit difficult sometimes. That's quite but a trial. Uh, quite a powerful song. It's a slower song, also. Yeah, yeah. and it's um, but it's it comes and goes. I think you know. Uh, some sometimes some song moves you, and the next night it doesn't. You know, so it, it depends on where you are mentally and, and what what's going on. And but yeah, sometimes yeah. And, and and also uh, sometimes you can get pretty emotional regardless of what you play, just because of of the moment you are in and in uh and the audience and everything what's going on and you could go like mm. oh my god this is you know beautiful and it doesn't necessarily have to do which which uh with which song it is mm. but if that makes any sense i don't know yeah absolutely and and is it does it tend to be the bigger concerts that you guys play where you have that reaction or can it be in a small one as well well we can happen anywhere i mean you can feel also sometimes um during the show you can feel really detached if you if you're not like uh, in the right uh, in the right mindset or in the right spot somehow and, uh, and that can also happen like big or small it doesn't really matter uh, at least not to me to me i mean some sometimes when you play it's you you are maybe emotionally on a different place than your bandmates 
or somebody mm. is, and it doesn't quite gel the way it's supposed to gel. And that's yeah, really, yeah, it's really, really hard to find. And you're trying like, am I going crazy? Is he's going crazy? You know, what's going on here? And sometimes mm. you have those kind of nights. And, and then when you, if you listen to a tape afterwards, it might sound totally fun, but like what's, what's going on uh, inside might sometimes be really, really weird. Mm. What is the hardest song to play live? What's the Sonata song that you think I've got to concentrate here? Yeah, there's all kinds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it depends on which one I haven't practiced enough. But um, <laughs> um, well, I have a right was was a bit interesting first, uh, and and the problem was not to play it, but the problem was to play and sing at the same time. And then there was some part in in, in Juliet where I had to play uh, one thing with my left hand and another thing with my right hand and then sing on top of that and then some sometimes it just doesn't happen you know uh but then uh, of course speaking of solos and stuff i think when i just joined the band uh trying to play uh, the intro to the cage and the solo so was a bit easier but but try, trying to learn jens uh, lead lines that was uh, that was quite hard uh and, and then uh, after that, I don't know. I mean, you stumble across some song that you go, oh, shit, this is hard. Uh, but that just means you have to practice harder. So yeah. it's like these days, I, I try to be in a place that, you know, maybe there might be some struggles in the rehearsal. But usually, like, I, I want to to be able to, 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 like, come to the rehearsal and not have to struggle with anything. Yeah. And then because then I know it, it's going to work live. But... But I mean, most the most difficult things is when you have to play something. Uh, it might not be that tricky, but then when you have to sing at the same time, then sometimes, sometimes it's really hard. Well, it's funny you should mention the cage, Henrik. But I need to ask you this question. So, you might remember, or you probably no, you don't. You might not know. So, when Tony did the first project with the orchestra, yeah, the the orchestra that we were working with at the time. I was torn as a fan between yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to play because I wanted to you know say that I played with Tony singing and it was going to be cool, yeah. but I also wanted to, I also wanted to watch it because yeah. I just wanted I just wanted yeah, to bathe yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't know what to do, and I debated for a long time as to whether I was going to. And of course, one of the songs was the cage, and so yeah. if I was going to play, that meant I had to learn the solo for the cage. So <laughs> this was a tough Did decision. You? So, true story, there were two shows. There was an afternoon show and there was an evening show. So I yeah. decided I was going to watch one and play one so I could oh. uh, try both. Yeah. All right. But, but the keyboard that I had to play, the sound was nothing like the solo. So right. it sounded terrible. <laughs> so you know how in that kind of solo, you're relying on like the sort of the fast yeah. movement from one yeah. from one uh, from one note to the next, and how it sort of yeah. can flick between one sound. That's all. That's yeah. all part of it. And I had to replicate that without having that kind of sound, and it was just impossible. <laughs> well, so, it's it's sometimes I, impossible even with the right sound. So. <laughs> so I tried and tried and tried. I remember sitting in my house trying to trying to write it out so I yeah. could so I had something to refer to. But it was so, so hard. And so I played the afternoon show and yeah. al almost did it, but it didn't sound right. amazing. And then in the evening show, the other guy tried to play it, and he clearly found it even harder. So it was even worse. <laughs> and I was like, this solo is ridiculous. And so yeah. I started to pay attention really closely whenever I watched you guys live. Uh. That solo... <laughs> and I know, having heard that song so many times, that solo is never quite the same twice, is it, Henrik? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, now, no, no. They, to some, uh, up to some point, I tried to play it the same, and then yeah. uh, at the end, when it when it's like even on the album, it's like a million notes, then it's just like whatever happens. Yeah, it, it's I understand. always been like that. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, because I'm, I, I know that some some people won't know this 
yeah. solar, which is outrageous. I, I want to uh, see if we can uh, let people hear a little bit of the solar that I'm talking about. So uh, let me just see if we can uh, get this on screen here. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a live recording. I think this is from your live DVD, maybe, uh, or certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I'm not sure where this was filmed. You'll you'll know better than me. But this is the solo that we're talking about, and this is why I really wanted to get Henrik on. Not not because this solo is never the same twice, just because it's an amazing solo. I know you didn't record it, but you've been playing it live for so many years. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Sinatra Artica, this is why this band are so fantastic. I didn't want you to sit there with your hand, your, your head in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was like, what, 2005. Yeah? Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's from the DVD. It's, uh, it's a long time. A long time ago. Yeah. Do you, th yeah. Do you think you've got it yet? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, we haven't actually played that in a while, but, but yeah, it's... Uh, do you ever watch any of the live concerts back? Uh, not so much. I mean, uh, because, you know, I was there. So, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, but sometimes um, there are some, uh, you know, uh, you watch like parts, uh, go back, for example, um, there's some some shootings from back in open air, which is a huge metal festival. Uh, I was there. The, big, the, the biggest, yeah. So you know yeah. how it is, and, and, and it's um. So sometimes you watch something here and there, but uh, but it's not really really something I have the time or well you have you find the time to do what you want to do, but uh, I I have other things that I, I prefer to. Do. But uh, but yeah, sometimes just to stumble across uh, old recordings, and, and uh, I think That's good for um, the memories. Yeah, maybe you know when you get to. An elderly home or something like that, and you can watch by back and not remember where you've been or something. But uh, yeah, I, I check some some stuff sometimes, but but not really regularly. Uh, that's good stuff. On listen, I really really appreciate your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you as part of this World Piano Day celebration. And uh, I would obviously encourage everyone who's not checked out Sonata Artica's music before to go and do that and check out all those great keyboard parts. Henrik, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. And You're enjoy the rest welcome. of the piano day. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>